Incidents with police that have shocked Colorado and changed laws have not always resulted in criminal convictions for those officers. The latest high-profile trial started today. A major tweak to Democrats' proposed ban on so-called assault weapons might not give it any better chance of passing in the end. A smaller electric provider shows how Excel could have handled the recent high winds without a preemptive power shutdown. And we will ask some of those who have served and now lead in our community to share the good news in their lives to round out our week. I just went over five years of marriage to my wife. Yes. <laughs> it's the news, and it's stuff that's a lot better than the news. Tonight on Next. Recent criminal trials of law enforcement officers accused of misconduct have shown that even incidents appalling enough to change policies in Colorado do not always lead to criminal convictions for the officers involved. The latest is in Georgetown for the killing of Christian Glass. Our Kelly Rinke's up there. And uh, Kelly, prosecutors say that Glass was having a mental health crisis when he was shot and killed, and that it was a crime. Defense team, for the former deputy, says Glass was a threat to them. Yeah, these are the theories we heard in opening statements, which, by the way, are happening after more than four days of jury selection. Finding jurors in this high profile case was not easy in a small county and in a case that's already seen a massive $19 million settlement in a lawsuit. But just because of these large payouts in these civil cases, it doesn't mean this is a slam dunk for prosecutors. And that's because of the much harder burden of proof the prosecution has to overcome the burden of proof beyond a reasonable doubt. Jurors yeah, very different theories that were shared in opening statements today. Christian Glass's parents were sitting side by side in that front row wearing his favorite color pink. People who loved Christian Glass wear a color in his memory. They walked into a Clear Creek County courtroom to see the former deputy who shot him stand trial for murder. District Attorney Heidi McCollum called Andrew Bune's actions aggressive and criminal. Before arriving on scene, she says Glass called 911 for help. His car was stuck and he appeared to be having a mental health crisis. He mistakenly thought that when he needed assistance, that the police would do just that. The prosecution says Glass wasn't a threat, even offered to throw weapons out of the car. Bune's defense attorneys disagree, saying he was more of a threat than the prosecution is describing. The defense said Glass wasn't having a mental health crisis, but instead was high on drugs and a car filled with weapons. There was no other choice in that moment in his mind but to shoot Mr. Glass in order to protect that chief from being stabbed by this knife that's being wielded. The theories couldn't be more different for what happened in Christian's last 90 minutes on this earth. Glass's mom is also planning to testify on Monday. Kyle Gould is on the defense, defense's witness list. He is the former deputy who was watching this all on live stream and gave the order for officers to break that window. He's already pleaded guilty in this case, Kyle. Kind of an unusual situation, Kelly, that he would have admitted wrongdoing or taken a plea, but then is testifying for the former colleague. Yeah, sometimes we find people that take these plea deals because eventually they're going to help the prosecution in their other cases. So the fact that he's on the defense witness list is a bit interesting and kind of unusual. And we certainly have seen some prominent acquittals of police uh, who have been accused of misconduct. John Hobart from Aurora PD just this week. Mm -hmm. Two out of the three officers accused in the death of Elijah McLean acquitted as well. So we will closely watch things up in Clear Creek County. Kelly, thank you. Democrats' most sweeping gun control measure at the state capitol this year is advancing a bit today, even as that ban on so-called assault weapons divides the majority party, the Democrats, and saw a significant change today. The bill is from two of the most far-left members of the House, Tim Hernandez and Elizabeth Apps of Denver. It would ban the manufacture, purchase, sale, or transfer of so-called assault weapons. The bill defines that term to include 50 caliber rifles or a semi-automatic firearm with a detachable ma magazine and a modification like a pistol grip or a muzzle brake. Originally, a violation of this would have been punishable by a massive quarter million dollar fine. Then it was amended to be a petty criminal offense. Now it's been changed back to a fine, but a far smaller one, $750. Republican critics still argue that the bill unfairly targets responsible gun owners like ranchers, hunters, and sports shooters. Bills like this you are targeting the law-abiding citizens. You are targeting the sports shooters, the hunters. You are targeting the people that simply carry for personal protection and protection of others. It's a bold choice to talk about targeting 
when who's been targeted are concert goers and school children, Coloradans and other Americans alike. Bill still has to pa pass a final vote in the House, likely later tonight, and the road only gets tougher from there because Democrats have a smaller majority in the Senate and Democratic Governor Jared Polis is openly skeptical of a state-level ban. He said it's a federal issue. So there is now a fifth Republican on the ballot in the race to replace former Congressman Ken Buck, and this is shaping up to be a dream scenario for Congresswoman Lauren Boebert. She switched districts for an easier race, and a larger primary field splits the anti-Boebert vote. Logan County Commissioner and former state legislator Jerry Sonnenberg is the latest to make the ballot officially. He's something of an establishment pick in the race. Sonnenberg joins state legislators Richard Holtorf and Mike Lynch, along with former talk radio host Deb Flora and Representative Boebert. Boebert will be on the top of the ballot because she won the most votes at the state assembly last week. Boebert has the backing of Donald Trump, as well as the endorsement of the Colorado Republican Party, which just changed its rules to abandon neutrality in the Republican primary and pick Boebert. The Democrats running for Buck's former seat are beyond long shots because this is the safest Republican congressional seat in Colorado. But the Democrats pick for the June special election to fill out Buck's seat for the rest of the year. She's facing a new legal challenge as to whether she is actually eligible to run. Democratic delegates recently selected Trisha Calvaries to run in the special election to fill a seat for the rest of the year. And she's also in the Democratic primary election seeking a full term, two-year term in that seat. Calvaries is a self-described Colorado native who recently moved back here after years in politics out of state. A lawsuit filed this week by a Democratic voter in Douglas County alleges that Calvaries is ineligible to be nominated because state law requires candidates to be registered with a Colorado party for a year before their nomination. She did not register to vote in Colorado until last December. The lawsuit asked the court to keep her name off the ballot. The Colorado Democratic Party is backing their candidate. They say that the law just means that a candidate has to be a registered Democrat somewhere for the last year. Excel's one and a half million electric customers makes it the powerhouse of providing power in Colorado. Core Electric Cooperative has one-tenth as many customers as Excel, but its power lines felt the same high winds as Excel's did last week, and Core did not preemptively shut off power to customers. Our Marshall Zellinger found that Core relied on safety measures that Excel chose to override. The view from this high point in Parker would be spectacular, if not for all those power lines in the way. Buzz, it's a good thing this story is about those power lines. This is Core Electric Cooperative territory. We serve Castle Rock, Parker, Elizabeth. Uh, we go out to Conifer, Bailey, places like that. With 177,000 electric customers, Core has one-tenth the footprint of Excel. But the wind still blew on Core's equipment just like Excel's, except Core did not purposefully shut off power to customers. It is part of our fire mitigation plan to do a power shutoff if we absolutely have to. That is our last resort. We don't want to do that just we understand the, the impact that has on people. Mark Jurgemeyer, CORE's interim chief operating officer, explained how these reclosers, basically circuit breakers, were made more sensitive to issues with the power lines, something CORE bragged about in an email to customers sent last night. CORE's alternate relay settings do not preemptively turn off any part of our system. They instead make the system more sensitive to potential issues, such as a tree on a line. Which means longer, larger outages than we would like, but it, it saves that fire and, and other danger. Excel, on the other hand, took the extreme measure to purposefully shut off power for 55,000 people last weekend. Excel also has reclosers, but as we reported yesterday, even a tree branch into a power line could start a fire before the recloser stops electricity from flowing. There is still always a chance that that initial contact will cause a spark which may start a fire, but Luckily, things have worked out pretty well. Some core customers in the mountains and foothills did lose power, but it was because of the wind and the action of the reclosers, not because the power was shut off purposefully. One question we've, re we've received from several people. How is it that my power might be out, but across the street, those neighbors have power? From the video, you saw three reclosers. That's because power is delivered through three wires. Your home may be on the wire that a tree fell into and the recloser opened, shutting off the electricity, but across the street might be on the second or third wire that was not interrupted.
So Excel's communication to customers is also going to be scrutinized by state regulators. What if they were to look at core as like a comparison? Right now, there's no complaints. And we got an email from Jen from Conifer, and she wrote, I, we were without power for 36 hours. I love core electric. Their communication was awesome through the whole thing. Smaller footprint, maybe sure. easier to, I mean, is it easier sure. to send an email to 177,000 people than 1.5 million people? I don't it's know. It's click, right? It's cl okay. I think it's the same click. But uh, yes, the, uh, Core is learning from this also, not just about c communication. I think they had a problem with like giving people estimated time for their power to come back on. Sure. It kept fluctuating. So like we'll work on that in the future. Excel just needs to work on providing a map. She said she loves her electric provider. How many emails roughly have you ever gotten about Excel? Hundreds? Easily. We're probably into the four figures by now, more than a thousand. How many have said, I love Excel, those words? Marshall know. Zellinger, thank you. <laughs> this is the 200th straight week of your word of thanks microgiving. That is a heck of a milestone. And we recently surveyed leaders of the nonprofits that you have supported over the years to ask which other nonprofit they might nominate. And one name came up more than any other. This week's word of thanks microgiving campaign, number 200, supports the work of the nonprofit Cross Purpose. Cross Purpose helps Coloradans break out of generational poverty by combining their six-month tuition-free career development program with counseling and coaching, one-on-one -on -one help to allow people to overcome any personal challenge holding them back. Cross Purpose's leaders, their graduates, do not leave the program until they are making a living wage and they are on a career track, not just holding a job, J-O-B. Other nonprofit leaders rave to us about Cross Purpose's results and the impact that their program makes by pulling families out of poverty. The idea is they can break the cycle and help generations get onto a better path in life. Scan the QR code on your screen or text the word thanks to 303-871-1491 to get that link to join me and a bunch of other Coloradans in donating. More than 2,000 of you have now signed up to simplify your giving with a monthly donation to the Word of Thanks Fund. Monthly supporters have become the foundation of this, starting each microgiving campaign off last month with $15,000 in the bank. Use that same QR code or text to get there. Leaders in a suburban city say they have a compromise now over a mental health facility opposed by some neighbors. The powerful people in Colorado relying on Spanish that they have learned often with great difficulty so they can better connect with voters. And a celebration of veterans who continue to serve in new ways. It's a wonderful place to go and ask our favorite Friday question. What's your good news? There's been very public grumbling by citizens and city leaders alike in North Glen that they were left in the dark about the details of a proposed state mental health facility. Now North Glen says the development will go forward with a compromise from the state. Colorado wants to transform two former senior living community buildings into transitional living for patients who have been discharged from higher level mental health hospitals. But neighbors and city council said they were concerned about how close the place was to a school because there'd be a small number of patients with prior sex offenses who could live there. Those concerns came to a head earlier this week with city council passing an ordinance requiring that sex offenders be housed farther away from schools. The state could have overridden the local restrictions, but North Glen's leaders say they have reached a compromise with the state today. It will allow the development to go forward with an agreement that prior sex offenders will not be housed there. Finally Friday, we made it through the week, and what a beautiful day with sunshine and 70s today. A look ahead, we have a warm, dry weekend and 80 degrees possible both Saturday and Sunday, but that also means elevated fire danger as the winds will be increasing ahead of a Pacific storm which is still offshore from California. Look at this dominant ridge of high pressure, beautiful weather for us for a few days, but the winds will shift coming in out of the southwest tomorrow, and they'll start to increase. Could see gusts to 25 and 30 miles per hour, so fire weather Watch red flag warnings posted for east central and southeastern Colorado because of that potential for low humidity and gusty winds. Tonight, there may be enough moisture out there for a sprinkle on your windshield along the foothills early on, but these showers are racing so quickly from the southwest to the northeast, I doubt you're going to see a drop of rain. And we're warm, mid 70s dropping into the mid 60s after 8 o'clock tonight. How about this extended and weekend forecast? 76 Saturday, 80 Sunday, ahead of cooler weather Monday, tracking the chance for showers Monday 
Monday night into Tuesday, and then another storm that has some cold air support. This one coming in Thursday into Friday. My good news is I don't have to work today. I get to enjoy the good weather down here in beautiful Denver. Let's hear for the weather, let's hear for the weekend, and honestly, whatever in your life gives you hope and joy. We'll end the week as we always do. Encouragement from your neighbors, next. May I make a recommendation? Point you toward journalism that comes from one of our competitors. Reporter Benito Kelty at Westward noticed how many of Colorado's most prominent political leaders speak Spanish as a second language. I really enjoyed this deep dive into how some non-Latino uh, legislators and mayors, governor, have learned the language to connect with their communities, like Mayor Mike Johnson of Denver, who regularly uses the Spanish that he honed as a school administrator and is now working to understand dialects and accents as he navigates the migrant crisis. Folks from South America. Or you got Aurora Mayor Mike Kaufman, former Republican congressman. Who, who, he's taken weekly Spanish lessons for the longest time, trying to reach Hispanic constituents and break his party's anti-immigrant image. It is a political story, sure, but it is a deeply human one. It's really interesting. You can find the full article linked on the next social media pages and on 9news.com. When I think about the phrase, a life of service, think about the folks going through the Leadership Veteran Program. They first served our country, and now they're serving as nonprofit leaders, often, again, serving fellow veterans. We stopped by their gathering today to ask them our favorite Friday question. It's a magical collection of our history in this country. It takes my breath away because uh, I'm fascinated with aircraft. There is a collection of human beings upstairs who are impacting and changing the lives of veterans and their families all over this state. My good news is I don't have to work today. Perfect place to wrap this program up for us. Everybody here is doing good things for what I consider my people. My good news is, uh, working for Veterans Community Project of Longmont, we have housed over 90 veterans and their family members since 2020. My good news is that I get to go to Capitol Hill next week to do advocacy work for veterans, and I am so excited. It's my second time going, and I just love doing that work. Hey, my good news is, we're now held at their annual um, suicide prevention gala at the Gaylord, and we were successful in reaching over $86,000. My good news is, um, after 27 years of being a veteran service um, in an organization where we get back to veterans, they are actually honoring me for my years of service by planting a tree in my name. Last night, my first great niece was born. My good news is that I have four new board members for my organization, Operation Equine, and these four people are going to help take us to the next level, and I couldn't be more excited. Yeah, we've done something, we've done something together, and we're all going to go out into the world being able to leverage all of these skills and, and connections to, to make things better for other people. Congratulations. Yay! We're back here in a moment with your feedback about more utility companies that you actually love. Next. Rob writes, three cheers for United Power and their customer service. Our home in Coal Creek Canyon was out of power during the recent storm. They were up to fix it within hours. They're fantastic. Amy says, I love my electric company in Fort Collins. All the lines except Southwest are underground. Due to that, huge winds, not one minute without power. And Shirley writes, about empowerment saying congratulations on 200 weeks of Word of Thanks. Empowerment for the charities, empowerment for the donors. The Word of Thanks opportunities prove yet again what we can do when we work together. See you next time.